or any of them places. And very few stories came out of the workhouse. And the reason of that being that no family ever wanted to admit that any one of them entered or lived or died in the workhouse. There's only a handful of stories that come out of that period. And this is one of them. <coughs> the four of them were in the wood cabin, Christmas Eve, 1847, six miles outside the workhouse. And there was only one thing for it, was to make the journey. It was snowing and cold, and they made the six mile trek. Kate was the wife, Patrick Buckley's was her name. The little boy was only two, and the girl, Grania, was four. And they made that lonely trek to the workhouse in Mallow. And when they arrived, the workhouse doors were closed. The place was absolutely jammed. It was built for 800 people, and there were 1,600 people inside them terrible walls. But because of the little children, they were eventually let in. And they were separated immediately. The little child had to go to the boys' board. The girl had to go to the girls' board. The husband had to go to the men's section. And the wife had to go to the women's section. And the day after Christmas, they kept inquiring about their children, separately. But the people in the workhouse could only speak English. And they only could speak Irish. And eventually, the chaplain came and told each of them that their children were dead and buried. And Patrick said he couldn't stay in this place one minute longer. So he got word to his wife that he was going to go back to his little cabin. And he walked out. And eventually he walked up Sock Road. I walked up it myself to see the great big pit. It's only a big mound of clay now. And he knew that his little children had been thrown coffinless into that great pit. And eventually he saw his wife coming up the road. But she was walking very slow because the sickness had got her. And the two of them tried their fill at the side of that great pit. 
and they decided to make their way the six mile northwest in the snow. After a little while, Kate couldn't walk any further. She said to Pat and finished Pat, you go on, leave me here. I'm going to die anyway. And of course Pat couldn't leave her there. He put her on his shoulder, even though he was completely weak at this stage. And it took him four hours before he got to the little cabin. And when he got there, it was cold and empty. <coughs> and the next day the neighbours heard that the two of them had come home. And they came with dry bread and water, something to give them. They had nothing themselves. And they went into the little cabin. And they found the two of them on the floor. And her feet was in his breast. He was trying to warm her feet before she died. And the two of them were dead on the floor. And the man that wrote this true story said, Some people might say that Patrick Buckley did a very heroic thing that night. But I say to you, he did only what was expected of a Christian. And that story was repeated thousands of times to the length and breadth of Ireland. And I said to the German, I know a lot of you young people died in Stalingrad and all the other terrible battles. But I said, don't forget, I said, one million Irish people perished out of a population of eight million. And in a short time, our population had dropped to four million. But they were scattered all over the world. As you know, the Irish are everywhere. And I said, don't tell us about not experienced Holocaust. Now, Paddy Cavanaugh's great hunger. Maguire had no fear of death. He stayed with his mother till she died. Forgotten she was 91. Oh, she stayed too long, for she was wife and mother all in one. And before she died, she was leaving the imprint of her knuckles in his ass. Jesus, he was 65. <laughs> ah, but he loved his mother above all others. He loved his cows, and he loved his plows, and his greatest delight was to wipe his ass in perennial grass along the banks of a summer stream. <laughs> to smoke his pipe in a sheltered bright in the middle of July. His face in a mist, two bones in his fist, and an important worm on his side. <laughs> but Maguire got tired of the no target gun fired. So he retired to his headlands of carrots and cabbage, to the fields once again, for eunuchs can be men, and life is more lousy than savage. Poor Patrick Maguire, a 14 hour day, he worked for years. Or to see they come down the stairs and lit the boiler fire and boiled the kettle and gave the calves their hay. I love this next line. <laughs> His mother, tall and hard as a Protestant spider, <laughs> came down the stairs barefoot at kettle call. <laughs> have you fed the hens, have you? <laughs> oh, she had a venomous thrall and a weather-beaten fist like what he delivered. Two black cats peeped through the panisters and gloated over a bacon sizzling pan. Outside on the downhill lay thin canisters. The snipe at dawn fell like a whirling stone. And by now Patrick on the headland stood alone. For the pull is on the traces for it is March. And a cold old black wind Blows in from the dark. The twisting sod rolls over on its back. The virgin screams before the irresistible sock. Oh, there's no trouble on Maguire's mind today. Except that he forgot his matches. <laughs> hop there, Polly, hop, whoa, whoa, back way. <laughs> from every second hill, a neighbor watches. With all the sharpened interest of rivalry. A beautiful prayer. Yet sometimes... When the sun shines through again, these men see God the Father on the tree. The Holy Ghost is the rising sun. 
and Christ will be the green leaf that will cover the Easter from those sealed and guarded tombs. Once one day in June, when he was walking with his captain in the yellow meadow, he met a young girl carrying a basket. He himself was a young man, foolish fellow, and he rushed up towards her, past the unseen, and then he saw sin written in letters, larger than John Bayon never dreamt of. And at that moment, youth and passion were strangled. And for that, there is no redemption. And the girl was gone. And he was standing alone in the field, counting the dangers where love for I saw his captain, and he stroked the flags in lieu of a wife to handle. Oh, he would change the circle if he could. The circle was a grass strike round the farm when he ran twenty times a day. And yet there was no winning post for the runners of cheered home. Desperately he tried to break the tune. But however he tried, all at the same old melody kept creeping up from the background. Like the weary step of a ploughman. Going home to the guttery headland. Under an April watery moon. Thank you. Uh, Shane Massini was very um, influenced by Patrick Cavanagh and uh, he too had a long poem called Station.